this unit, we are going to be talking about chemical equilibrium. And equilibrium is actually not a new term for us. We've actually looked at it in two previous units. We looked at it in the gas unit when we were talking about evaporation. When the rate at which molecules leave the liquid form to become gases equals the rate at which gases then reform to become liquids, you have reached a state of dynamic equilibrium, meaning the two rates of the opposing processes are equal. We also looked at it when we were in the solution unit, specifically when you have a high concentration of solute that has been dissolved, you will reach the point at which your solution is now saturated, meaning if you add any more solute, no more will dissolve. And the reason why was because if you have enough solute that has dissolved into its ions, then that increases the probability that those ions will strike the solid and crystallize. So at that point, the rate at which ions are being formed by dissolving equals the rate at which solids are reformed by crystallization. Those are two opposite processes. So when they, the rate of them are equal, you are in a state of dynamic equilibrium. So in this unit, we're going to be looking at equilibrium, but specifically for chemical reactions. So we call that chemical equilibrium. So again, chemical equilibrium occurs when opposing reactions are proceeding at equal rates. Now, the important thing for you to know specifically for chemical reactions is it's when the rate at which the products are formed from the reactants, so that's the forward reaction, equals the rate at which the reactants are formed from the products. So that would be the opposite process, that would be the reverse reaction. So those two are equal. When they are equal, you are in chemical equilibrium. So there are two requirements for equilibrium to occur. The first one is that the concentrations of the reactants and the products can no longer change with time. The important thing to keep in mind is the fact that the reaction is still occurring, you just don't see any change in concentration. That's why we call it dynamic equilibrium. The second is that neither the reactants nor the products can escape from the system. If those two conditions are met, you're in equilibrium. So if you look here at these two graphs, at A, what this is showing you is that at time equals zero, you have N2O4, but you have no NO2. So what that tells me is that N2O4 can either be my reactant or my product. And what this graph is showing me is that even though I don't start off with any NO2, I will eventually reach equilibrium. And after that dotted line, what you should notice, since your y-axis is concentration, yeah, they're not equal. Your concentrations don't have to be equal to be in equilibrium, but notice they are not changing concentrations. So after equilibrium has been reached, the concentration of NO2 and N2O4 do not change. For B, what this is showing, you notice the y-axis is rate. And so at this point, Notice that the rate at which N2O4 disappears and NO2 forms after equilibrium has been achieved, those rates are equal. Here what this is showing you, these two graphs show you that it doesn't matter whether or not you start with your reactants or your products, you can still reach equilibrium. So the graph on the left hand side shows you that you start with your reactants, H2 and N2, and NH3 is your product. So you start with just your reactants but you're still able to reach equilibrium because the concentration of NH3 increases until you reach equilibrium. Notice it's equilibrium because the concentration of those three substances do not change. For the second graph on the right hand side, notice I start with what I would consider typically my product and I start with no reactant and yet I still reach that same equilibrium. So it doesn't matter what you start with as long as you provide your reaction with the conditions, a closed system necessary for equilibrium to be established, equilibrium will be established. So now that we've talked about chemical equilibrium qualitatively, let's talk about it quantitatively. So what I have right here is just a generic reaction. Keep in mind that the lowercase letters represent your coefficients while your uppercase letters represent your substances. And I have this double arrow and that represents the fact that that, chem that reaction reaches chemical equilibrium. So the law of mass action actually expresses the relationship between the concentrations of reactants and of the products once you have reached equilibrium. So specifically, the equilibrium constant expression, that demonstrates the relationship as expressed by the law of mass action. 
So specifically what you do is you say the constant, your equilibrium constant, which is your Kc, that equals the concentration of your product, D, raised to its coefficient times the concentration of E raised to its coefficient divided by, and then the same thing, but this time with the reactants. So notice your products are in the numerator while your reactants are in the denominator. So what this table is showing you is a bunch of different experiments in which I start with different concentrations of N2O4 and NO2. N2O4 is my reactant and NO2 is my product. So notice for experiment one, I start with no N2O4, but a little bit of NO2. The next one still no N2O4, but a little bit more of NO2. And you can see how all of these are very different. What you should notice though, yes, they're, the concentration that they reach when they're in equilibrium are different, but look at their equilibrium constants. They're all the same. And so what this demonstrates to you is that no matter how much reactant or how much product you start with, once these reactions reach equilibrium and you can actually calculate their equilibrium constant at the same temperature, the equilibrium constant will stay the same. If you change temperature, then the equilibrium constant will change, but otherwise it will stay constant. Up until this point, we've been talking about the equilibrium constant and the equilibrium constant expression in terms of concentration. Well, we can actually also write this in terms of pressure when we're dealing with gases. And so this is actually how we would write the equilibrium constant expression for pressure. It's your Kp. Kp is your equilibrium constant now. And now you just use partial pressures rather than concentrations. So this is extremely similar to the equilibrium constant expression for concentration. Now, how do we relate our equilibrium constant for concentration to that of pressure? Well, if you remember the ideal gas law, if we change this around just a little bit by dividing both sides by V, you get that pressure equals your number of moles divided by volume times RT. What you should recognize is the fact that N over V, that equals concentration. Okay, So that represents PA is the partial pressure of A equals the concentration of A times R times T. And so all you have to do now is substitute in your KP and your KC. The only difference being the other thing you have to consider is delta N. Delta N is the change in number of moles of gas. So for example, if I start with one mole of gas on my reactant side and I end up with two moles of gas on my product side, then my delta N would simply be one. If I end up with the same number of moles of gas on both sides, then my delta N would be zero and my Kp would actually be equal to my Kc. So it's the only thing that you have to additionally consider, but here's this right here is the equation for relating Kp to Kc. So let's actually look at an example in which we're calculating our equilibrium constant. And three things for you to keep in mind. The first is that your equilibrium constant depends on the stoichiometry now, not the mechanism. And so we'll be using the coefficients from the reaction. Secondly, the expression is only valid for gases in aqueous solution. So therefore, if you have a solid or a pure liquid, you are not going to include it in your equilibrium expression. So let's look at an example. Here it gives you your equilibrium reaction and it asks you to write the equilibrium expression. So remember your equilibrium constant, and here I'm gonna be using concentration. It could be pressure, but I look at B and C that we're talking concentration. That equals the concentration of H2 raised to the fourth. I'm not, going, I'm not going to include iron oxide because it is a solid. So I'm going to put the concentration of hydrogen gas raised to the fourth over, well, for my reactants, the only reactant that I'll use in my equilibrium expression is going to be water. So it's going to be water raised to the fourth. Okay, so now it asks me to find the equilibrium constant when I have 0.1 molar of water and 0.2 molar of hydrogen gas. And so my Kc is going to be equal to, well, 0.2 is the concentration of H2, so 0.2 raised to the fourth divided by 0.1 raised to the fourth. And so my Kc is going to be 16. So that's all there is to it. I'm now going to relate free energy, which we talked about quite a bit throughout this big idea and the equilibrium constant. Specifically, your standard free energy change equals negative R 
times t times the natural log ln of your equilibrium constant, your k. Your r in this case is going to be 8.314. Your temperature is just going to be in Kelvin. So let's look at an example here. It tells me that my standard free energy change for the reaction is negative 33.3 kilojoules per mole, and it asks me to calculate the equilibrium constant K. So I'm going to use this equation right here. I know that my standard free energy is negative 33.3 kilojoules per mole. If you look at your units for R, it's actually in joules, and so I'm going to convert this standard free energy into joules really quickly by simply multiplying by 1,000. So it's going to be negative 33,300 joules per mole equals my the negative r which is negative 8.314 joules per mole kelvin and that's given to you times my temperature notice my temperature needs to be in kelvin so it's going to be 25 plus 273 which is 298 and then i'm going to multiply that by the natural log of k and so i'm going to solve for just the natural log of k here that equals 13.4 now, just as a reminder, if your natural log is simply another way of expressing it is just log base E. So to get rid of the natural log, I need to take E and I need to raise it to 13.4 and that will give me K. Okay, so E raised to the 13.4 and that equals 6.60 times 10 to the fifth. Now, just as a review, when I'm at equilibrium, my free energy change equals zero. Therefore, when my delta G is negative, what that tells me based on the equation we just used, that means that my natural log of K must be positive, okay? And to get ln of K to be positive, your K, your equilibrium constant, must be greater than one. Now, what exactly does that mean for it to be greater than one? Well, if it's greater than one, what that means is that there are more products than reactants, because remember, it's products over reactants equals your equilibrium constant. And so I know that my products are going to be favored. Therefore, when you have a spontaneous reaction, your products are favored, which makes sense, because that reaction is proceeding in the forward direction, so your products should be favored. Now, if your delta G, if your standard free energy change, is positive, then your natural log of K must be negative, and therefore your equilibrium constant must be less than one, which makes sense, because if your standard free energy change is positive, that means that the forward reaction is not spontaneous, which means that the reverse is, which means that your reactants would be favored.